I'm Cynthia Myers Morrison. I am the vice chair for the Food Addiction Institute, foodaddictioninstitute.org, and webinar co webinar co chair with David you know, Avram Wolf, my smiling friend here. Uh, we have with us today um, Dr. Robert Pretlow. Dr. Pretlow graduated with honors from Princeton University. He received his MD from the University of Virginia Medical School where he also did his internship and residency in pediatrics. He is a board certified person in pediatrics and a, is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. He has a master's of science in electrical engineering from Old Dominion University. Dr. Pretler has published numerous articles, been awarded five US patents and has presented very many articles of, excuse me, abstracts, keynotes, plenaries, panels, and tutorials at national and international conferences. He is the author of the book, Overweight, What Kids Say, What's Really Causing the Childhood Obesity Epidemic. He is the founder and director of waytorock.com, W-E-I-G-H, the number two, rock.com, an online weight loss system for teens and preteens used by clinics and schools, private practitioners, hospitals, community centers, and health clubs worldwide. Recently, Dr. Predlow has developed a childhood obesity intervention based on addiction treatment model and implemented as a smartphone app. ABC News did a story about this app, and we have a wonderful opportunity to listen as Dr. Robert Pretlow speaks on treatment of childhood obesity, childhood and adolescent obesity, treatment of childhood adolescent obesity. Welcome, Dr. Pretlow, and it's all yours. Treatment of child and adolescent obesity as an addictive process. Bariatric surgery is currently the only treatment for child and adolescent obesity with sustainable results. It is really now considered the treatment of choice for moderate to severe obesity in, in teenagers and even now in starting to be in, suggested in preteens. But bariatric surgery has significant risks and long-term side effects. We need alternatives equally as effective for treatment of child and adolescent obesity. So what else might be possible? Well, there are what are called residential immersion programs. These are fat camps and obesity rehabilitation centers. They produce large weight loss, not as good as surgery, but much more than traditional programs like diet and exercise. How might we replicate in the real world at a much lower cost what goes on at these obesity rehab centers so this is that we be more widely available? Well, what actually, happens at these obesity rehab centers. It's really a process of forced food withdrawal in conjunction with a thing called cognitive behavioral therapy. And this brings to mind what, what actually takes place at drug addiction rehab centers. And there's actually mounted evidence that overeating and obesity involves an addictive process. There are brain fMRI, brain scan similarities to those that are obese, to those with known addictions. And the relationship with food described by obese individuals satisfies the DSMO WHO addiction criteria. So could or should we be using addiction model methods to treat child and adolescent obesity? The addiction, the addiction basis of child and adolescent obesity is quite controversial and debated. Nevertheless, even if an addictive basis has not yet been established, we may still use addiction model methods to treat child and adolescent obesity. This brings up the construct of food addiction, which pretty much is defined as a direct effect of food ingredients on the reward system of the brain, similar to that of a drug, for example, sugar. There are over 100 studies demonstrating the effectiveness of sucrose water to produce analgesia in infants and children for painful procedures like heel sticks. It's been reported that sweets improve depression in women. And soda consumption, of course, has been linked very much to obesity, especially in children and adolescents. 
And then there are what are called high glycemic index foods, which the, the David Lustig's group has explored quite a bit. And these foods are, are felt to be addictive because they cause spikes. They, they, what actually happens with, highly, with high glycemic index foods is when they're digested, metabolized, they produce spikes in blood sugar, which is kind of like a rush. And then they also produce a reactive spike in insulin levels, which then therefore the blood sugar plummets and, they, and David Lustig group claims this causes cravings. And therefore he, they feel that this is what's responsible in large part for the obesity epidemic. For example, addiction to things like flour and, and carbohydrates. But on the flip side of this, bulimics purge, but they still become addicted to, for example, sweets. And if it's, if it's high glucose, if it spikes in glucose that, are, that causes this addiction, well, drug addicts don't shoot up on IV glucose or IV saline salt solution or, or fast solutions. But what is most compelling against this idea of a direct effect on the brain or food addiction is neuroscience data. Brain scans have, has not shown an addictive effect of food ingredients, for example, sugar, on the brain's reward system, similar to that of a drug. Now, in light of this, this controversy, the group Neurofast in Europe has, has coined a new term, proposed a new term, eating addiction, which really they say is the, is the relationship of the obese individual with food rather than, is it, rather than the effect of the food itself. And therefore, they, they, they classified this as a, this obesity overeating as a behavioral addiction. I think there are behavioral addictions similar, for example, like gambling addiction. But I think there's definitely truth in this idea of eating addiction makes more sense than food addiction. But I think probably more accurately, it should be, just, should be labeled as overeating addiction. Now, even though there's no evidence of a direct effect of food ingredients like sugar on the brain's reward system, Obese individuals definitely see to prefer and seek out certain foods. Paul Fletcher's group at Cambridge says that these behaviors likely arise from the sweet tasting or highly palatable foods rather than the neurochemical effects of the foods. So therefore, it appears that it's the taste, texture, and temperature of a food that produces the dopamine rush in the brain rather than the neurochemical effects. And this ostensibly would be addicting, so therefore a sensory addiction. And this sensory addiction is, would be similar or similar to the sensory addiction, for example, in sex addiction or gambling addiction, where they get a rush from, for example, winning. So in addition to this sensory addiction component of overeating addiction, I think there's also a motor addiction component involving the actions of eating, the biting, chewing, gnawing, crunching, sucking, licking, swallowing, and hand-to-mouth motion. And when these behaviors are excessive, they are similar to what are called body-focused repetitive behaviors, like, like nail biting, skin picking, hair pulling, and nervous tics. And therefore, the, the, and actually these, are, these body-focused repetitive behaviors are felt to be behavioral addictions when they're, when they're excessive. And therefore, treatment or behavioral addictions like these body-focused repetitive behaviors might be applicable to treatment of obesity. There is laboratory evidence of this motor addiction eating. There was extensive research conducted in the 1970s and 80s on what's called tail pinch behavior in rats. If simply, simply placing a non-painful clamp on a rat's tail, which, which is a very irritating and, and stresses the rat, was actually observed in, in multiple studies to, to pretty much cause reproducible overeating of, by the rat of the standard rat chow to the point of obesity. This may be what's, what the brain is, is using here is a thing called displacement behavior, which is universal among the animal kingdom. Animals, when they're threatened by predators, for example, will do things that have nothing to do, they'll have behavior, nothing to do with the actual event, the, the predator threatening itself, for example, rat, uh, excuse me, birds will preen themselves if they're threatened by a predator or, or eat, eat grass. Uh, and uh, this, and or, or so that also dogs, when they're stressed, for example, will, will gnaw their paws down to the point of, of causing damage. 
So this displacement behavior, maybe, maybe what's going on with this motor addiction eating, the brain is kind of hijacked that. I can, I can anecdotally attest to that. My, doc, my doctor suggested that I eat walnuts to, walnuts to help my cholesterol. So each night before dinner, I would eat a handful of walnuts, which I really got to look forward to. It was kind of a time of relaxing and munching on those walnuts. But one week, I purchased a bag of walnuts that were pretty much rancid and, and moldy and tasted pretty awful. And I was not able to go back to the store for several days to purchase another bag. And I found myself still, still eating these rancid, kind of terrible tasting walnuts just to get that crunchy, munchy feeling, relaxation kind of feeling. Therefore, it, it appears that the brain tends to adopt or probably hijack any behavior that eases emotional distress. In this case, overeating. So what actually drives young people to overeat? We asked this question of the participants in our last study, and here's what several of them said. Well, my, my biggest trigger is when the food's right there in front of me. My friends, you know, they eating something and say, oh, you want some? And then I would, just wouldn't be able to say no. All thoughts of, like, like losing weight, my brain just, like, pushing on the side, what drives me to like take it? I just really like the way food tastes, feels good, tastes good, makes me happy. After I eat, I feel horrible afterwards. So you might think that this young fellow is driven to eat by pure pleasure, but you notice that he says that his motivation gets pushed aside and then he feels horrible afterwards. So this suggests that something's really driving him, that that's like a brain thing, maybe like an addictive process. So what is making me want to eat the food? I think it's just mainly a, like a boredom, not having anything to do. It's definitely hard for me to think about because when you're bored, you feel alone. I will eat because it'll take my mind off of feeling alone. And I'm afraid not to eat because I don't want to feel alone. If I didn't give in, I don't know what I would do. So this young gal is really using food as a coping mechanism to cope with boredom but she doesn't know what she'd do if she can't stop, she says. I think I eat too much because like sometimes when I'm sad or something, I'll just eat for some reason. I don't know why. I think it's just like comfort food or something. After I eat it, I feel like bad that I did eat it. So this young man, this 11-year-old boy, recognizes that he eats for comfort, but he says he feels bad afterwards. So it again suggests that this is like almost like an addictive process if he feels bad that he does this. If I get depressed, if I get um, stressed, uh, I have noticed um, that I do, I do want to eat something. I look for something or I'll pick something up and I'll just eat it without even thinking, not even tasting the food. So I already know that one of my main problems and the reason that I'm so overweight. Um, I'm trying to control it. Um, I feel like almost like a drug user, like a drug user or an alcoholic. And it's sort of the same thing because I turn to food for, um, to help suppress any anxiety or stress or, or problems I have. And then they can't stop. I was consumed by consuming. And now look, look, look where it's got me. I was way overweight. I always felt like I was in control. I was just making a decision. But in reality, I was doing it because, like, you know, it's like an addiction almost. Like, I had to. And they, like other forms of addiction, tolerance develops where they need even more of the substance, in this case, the, the food, the eating. The 70 year old girl says, it's like a drug. What used to satisfy you before now has no effect. I feel like I've become immune to the foods that used to comfort me. And like drugs, you keep moving on to bigger, worse things in order to get the same feeling as when you started out. And then it messes up their life, which increases their stress, and this results in eating more and more, a vicious cycle. Every time I'm stressed, this young fellow says I eat and my weight is making me stressed. It's also something that parents get involved in. They, they become 
they they enable this overeating addiction in their in their children. Why? Because they get love back from their child when they give these treats or extra food to the child, and then the parent develops actually a codependence on the treats and food. But what happens next is that the parent then may realize that their child is becoming overweight or obese, and they try to cut back on these treats and extra food. But the child reacts because they don't want to go through withdrawal from this food fix that they've been used to. And they therefore become, they become hostile and abusive to the parent in that situation. So the parent gives the treats to avoid the ire of, of their child. In other words, the parent becomes hostage to these treats and food at that point. And the food companies understand this. Well, this is an amazing pie. It's so good. It's insanely good. See? I think you missed stuff. Oh, it's the roof over my head. Stuff like that. Just come on more often. They're having such exquisite taste. Give the cool whip. Get the love. Give the cool whip. Get the love. Food companies understand this. Well, what happens then, of course, the parent, as I say, enables this and they get hooked on this like a child. So what do young people think about treating obesity as an addiction? I would compare it to uh, any addiction, uh, like a drug addict, like an alcoholic. It's the same thing with food. There's just one difference. You have to eat. So is it therefore possible to duplicate what takes place at obesity rehabilitation centers in the real world? Well, withdrawal from food is trickier than withdrawal from a drug because total abstinence of food, of course, is not possible. As this young lady says, you have to eat. However, withdrawal and total abstinence from snacking is possible, eating between meals is possible. And withdrawal by gradually decreasing excessive amounts at meals is also possible. You won't have to deal with withdrawal symptoms, just like coming off a drug, and also loss of a coping mechanism. But just to use an addiction treatment approach then, the idea of course is to simply eat less, eliminate snacking between meals, eliminate excessive amounts at meals. So in the use we'd have to, in order to cope with the withdrawal symptoms, we'd have to use addiction model methods. And for the sensory component of this overeating addiction, we'd use withdrawal abstinence, simple classic withdrawal abstinence, which is used for drug, drug addiction cessation and smoking. It, we, in, in terms of food, we call it staged food withdrawal. And also then the second technique that's used for sensory, for, for drug addiction is what's called exposure response prevention. And then for the motor addiction component of this overeating addiction, we'd use body-focused repetitive behavior, uh, behavioral addiction methods. And these two components we treat, we treated separately, but in parallel. In terms of overeaten foods, there seem to be two types. There are specific foods which are particular problems to the individual or they can't resist when immediately available or can't stop eating when they start. This is suggestive, these specific foods are suggestive of a drug of choice like candy, soda, pizza, chips, fast food. And this really sounds like a sensory addiction or as the participants say, they call it comfort eating. Then there are nonspecific foods, whatever is available in the moment. 72% of those in our last those prisoners in our last two studies say that when they overeat for snacking and at mealtime, it's whatever is available in the moment. And therefore, this sounds like a motor addiction, similar to nail biting and skin picking. And the participants call this nervous eating. Now, you might say, well, if they eat whatever is available in the moment and in terms of snacking, they may still be in a house where there's nothing but junk food available. However, this particular young man says it's not just junk food. Like if I find myself not doing something for a period of time, it's like, well, hey, you know, that steak in the fridge sounds awful good right now. So he overeats the steak in the fridge, whatever is in the fridge. Now then, how would the sensory addiction component stage withdrawal, food withdrawal work? Well, for problem foods, this what they identify, they would they would proceed through abstinence from each problem food one by one, it's like coming off smoking. For snacking, grazing, non-specific foods, they would go through abstinence, but only during certain, during certain time intervals, because it's not any specific food. Like, for example, morning, they wouldn't snack, and then the afternoon, for the rest of the afternoon, and then the so on. And they would progress eventually to zero snacking for the entire day. For, for the withdrawal from excessive food amounts, they would eyeball or measure the typical amount of each food 
that they eat frequently at meals or served at meals and then incrementally reduce those amounts per their weight loss. If they're losing weight, they would totally, if they're not losing weight, they would reduce even more. Problem foods elimination. First and first and first, the person first identifies and lists all their problem foods and then proceeds to abstain from them for, for a minimum of 10 days. That seems to be a magic number with daily check-ins. Did I eat the food? Or being responsible to someone. And this is similar to what's called the Schick Shadel method, where they can where Schick Shadel says they can cure any addiction within 10 days. After 10 days, the individual, the child is, is labeled as in control, then, then they withdraw from the next food. This, this problem through withdrawal does not produce a lot of weight loss, but this does seem to be a gateway to other forms of food withdrawal, like snacking withdrawal and food amounts. Now, as far as the second technique called exposure response prevention, it would be things like triggers avoiding, staying out of the kitchen, preventing boredom, and use of aversive stimuli like gross pictures and smells in the moment of a craving, and simply snapping a rubber band against its wrist. That works for other types of, of addictions, behavioral addictions, and it seems to work pretty, pretty well for urges to snack and so forth, to go to the kitchen. And then distractions, simply distracting with hobbies keeps these urges at bay. And, and a thing called distress tolerance, or I think we were talking about urge surfing. Urge surfing works very well to prevent this problem food with cravings and also this snacking, the, whatever's available urges. For secondly, this eliminate snacking, the second step, are we talking about, again, non-specific between meal eating, whatever is available, and they would therefore then do abstinence, practice abstinence during specific time intervals like morning, afternoon, evening, or nighttime. And once they do this for 10 days in one time period, they then progress to the next time period for 10 days until eventually they're not snacking for the entire day. They may, they may exhibit withdrawal symptoms from this for the snacking cessation in which case you can break it down into smaller steps. For example, to, when they come home from school, just try not to snack for one hour, and the next day, that maybe two hours. And the next day, if they're successful, maybe three hours until they're not snacking when they come home from school, and then they progress to other intervals in the entire day. Now, this idea of food restriction has been criticized by the eating disorders fields as possibly gonna precipitate binge eating. However, our participants in our studies actually said that binge eating decreased substantially with this food restriction process down by 80 percent in our last two studies approximately and i think what happens with the eating disorders studies when they restrict eating is they don't wait long enough for the withdrawal symptoms to subside so the individual gets these terrible cravings urges and then they cave and eat the stuff binge again and they're right back where they started from them at the repeat the process over and over again this idea of urge surfing or distress tolerance was a technique attributed to psychologist Alan Marlatt for drug addiction, with, drug addiction withdrawal. He had an assumption that an urge never lasts forever and therefore the individual could ride out these urges. They just step back, observe the urge, but just don't act on the impulse. The participants in our studies, when they practiced this urge surfing, they had different ways of interpreting it. For example, what do you do when you urge surf? Um, you just like yeah, sit back and have your urges but don't give in. Yeah, I do like urge surfing. I think that really helps. I, I just kind of stop thinking about whatever it is I want and I just kind of kind of just wait and then it kind of goes away. Now we, we, we observed in our studies that young people seem to have little, little or no imagination on how to self-entertain themselves other than eating. This mother has some pretty good comments about this. We made a play date yesterday to go to the park. We had bikes and scooters involved, but they got bored and they wanted to go home, and then they got hungry. And I think what happens is that we don't allow our kids to get bored and solve their problems. We try to solve it for them, like, okay, you're bored, here's something to eat. And so then it becomes this, I can't experience this boredom to the point where I'll think of something to do. And once I finally accepted the fact that we guys have to find something to do, they started to have a really good time. And then when it came time to leave, they didn't want to go. So distractions can be anything they like to do. Uh, and then what they do is write these ideas for distractions down on pieces of paper and stick them in a jar. And then when they have an urge to snack, they pull out an idea and then just, just do it. In the beginning, it was really hard for me to get away from snacking. I would just get my mind off of it and just stick to the distraction ideas. I would play my guitar or play with my dog. 
For the motor addiction component, again, we use these body focused repetitive behavior kind of methods or behavioral addiction methods. For example, triggers avoidance, not going where the foods are to munch. Stress management, for example, problem solving and relaxation techniques like deep breathing, yoga breathing works very well. Alternatives to behaviors like simply squeezing the hands can keep the individual from giving in to these urges. Or keeping their hands busy while watching TV works amazingly well to keep them from snacking while watching TV. Stress manager writing their problems down and a plan for each problem helps quite a bit. The third step is to reduce their amounts of meals. Again, by triggers avoidance, get away from the food. Buffet style meals work very well. Smaller plates and glasses and so forth. But also they eyeball or measure all of their food items that they eat at meals and then incrementally reduce the amounts. Eyeballing the amounts can work just measuring by looking at it. For example, if you have a, a glass with a certain Signy on the glass where you get your, your eggs up to that point, then you can drop down below that, below that point when you're trying to reduce the amount. Or if your bowl of cereal, you can you start out an inch and you can drop down to two inches, for example, by measuring that way, uh, or just the number of teaspoons of yogurt that you eat. But the thing that works by far the best to, is to, to nail down exactly the amount that they're eating, which is to weigh their, weigh their amounts, weigh all their food amounts. As one, I think it's, I'm not sure who said it, but it was a very famous quote that says, if you can't measure it, you can't change it. We implemented this whole process as a smartphone app. <clears throat> and the smartphone app takes the individual through problem foods withdrawal, snacking withdrawal, and excessive amounts at mealtimes withdrawal. It is interfaced, the app is interfaced to a food scale wireless food scale and they log in, they log all the amounts that they typically eat and then the app gradually reduces their amounts and when they have their meals, the app, they put their foods on the dish, on the, on the little scale and the app tells them how much to remove as it gradually cuts their amounts down. It says, no, then your weight's acceptable, then they can eat. It uses their, uh, their weight as a way to gauge how much to reduce their amounts. If, if their weight's not going down, the app continues to reduce their amount, amounts down uh, if their weight stays the same, the app will hold their amounts constant until their weight stops dropping. Weighing the foods out would make me feel more comfortable, um, just because I know exactly the numbers, and the numbers can't lie, but my brain can. And they don't even realize that their amounts are being decreased in this app process because they're decreasing such small increments. When I weigh the food, when will it, like when will the portion size start going down? Because right now it doesn't feel like it's going down at me. You are like seventy-six percent of your starting amount. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh my god, I didn't even. Oh god, <laughs> that's awesome. Wow, that's really so crazy. Um, I definitely think that weighing my meals was what really helped me the most because that like kind of made me, it first of all made me realize how much I was eating, and then it made me realize how much I could cut down and it would be that bad. And it really is just whatever they're eating. We don't have any special diet. This boy, for example, was eating almost uh, almost two pounds of chicken fingers. That was his typical meal. And he decreased it down to less than half of that. And I remember he said to me, 13-year-old boy, he said, I can't believe I lost weight eating bad food. What obstacles, what obstacles do we encounter with this process? Well, withdrawal symptoms, just like coming off a drug, anxiety, depression, uh, and so forth. With problem foods and snacking withdrawal, we, we observe minimal withdrawal symptoms, but with withdrawal from excessive food amounts, we observe significant withdrawal symptoms, of nagging urges, agitation, anger, but rarely true hunger. We, and the way you cope with that or help with that is that you assure the, indiv assure the, assure the individual that the withdrawal symptoms will get better and they won't notice the amounts, their amounts decreasing. They really won't miss the food. Now, the individuals, interestingly, they, they term these withdrawal symptoms, they call them, they call it hunger. And this brings up the concept of body hunger versus brain hunger. Body hunger is a sensation, grumbling in the stomach, lightheadedness. Body hunger is fairly tolerable, just like being sleepy. You don't fall on the floor to go to sleep when you're sleepy. Brain hunger, however, on the other hand, is an emotion. It's a feeling, not true hunger the feel and need to eat, and it's frequently stress-induced, and it's difficult to tolerate. In order to, do, to deal with this, the, the kids in our studies use these methods like urge surfing and distractions for, for this 
body hunger, excuse me, for this brain hunger. And they readily distinguish between body hunger versus brain hunger. They really can, readily, readily can identify brain hunger. Also, they have a loss of their main coping mechanism, ED, and they have to replace that with something else, like problem solving. They can do volunteer work, uh, have friends, uh, even seek counseling. And the kids in our studies, these young people, they exhibited obfuscation, rationalization, deflection, denial, bargaining, lying, cheating, very, very similar to drug addicts. What, see, what see, we found to help with that is this coaching, weekly phone calls to each participant, and daily text messages seem to help that quite a bit. They also said their amounts look weird when they cut them down because what we say this is actually what your body needs to run on. The typical amounts, for example, for participants in our studies, they were starting out with twice as much or more than their body needed to run on. These are what their amounts look like when they've cut them and where they need to, where their weight is, is starting to finally get down and be stabilized. And of course, they do look kind of weird, half a hamburger and so forth, but this is what their body needs to run on. And that in itself is kind of a revelation to them. This is what I've lived on for the last 12 years, three-fourths of a bagel at lunch. That's all I can eat. If I eat more than that, my weight goes up. We've now done several pilot studies. We published a paper, one on 2017 and 2015, and now Children's Hospital Los Angeles has just conducted a, a two-year study comparing this app program to their standard weight loss multi-specialty clinic program, and they found a significant difference, significant decrease more in the app study than in their, their multi-specialty clinic study. Now, we've looked at now, we're looking at what's called management in the moment, so that they have, for example, these little things that tell themselves in the moment when they have an urge that sadness from eating, sadness from regaining weight is worse than the sadness they get from not eating the food, and they write down what they feel after they, if they cave, what they feel afterwards, so they can look at that the next time they're tempted in the moment. And we even have you know, a thing in the app where they can press and record what they feel like after they've caved to a temptation, and then they can then play that to themselves the next time they have a temptation to hopefully prevent them from giving in again. And this is a thing we looked at that's called ecological momentary assessment is the psychological term for this. Um, it really just means looking at things in, that the person do things in the moment rather than after the fact or, or even trying to plan before the fact. This, we, looked at, we, we looked at this in terms of the fact that young people in our study, we asked them, do you have bothersome urges to eat that you would like to stop? And we were flabbergasted that nearly 85% said, yes, they have these bothersome urges to eat, they want to stop. How much would they like them to stop on a mean of, four, of one to five, with five being the greatest, the mean was 4.37. So they want them to stop a lot. So we thought this could be motivation for getting them to do this, this urge, this, uh, this, this in the moment intervention. And we put something now in our app, we call it the rescue button, the tap on when they have, a, when they have this, these bothersome urges to eat in the moment, they would tap on this, and then it would take them through a, a real, this is kind of complicated algorithm when they tap on this rescue button, it would then guide them to all the different parts of the app that normally they may not even be aware, remembered, but it would take them through it in the moment to help them at that point. So we'll see if we're going to do this in our next study. So the next study is going to be a multi-center randomized control trial involving seven centers. This has been organized by the Southern California Pediatric Obesity Association. It also has a center in Alabama. And this will be a multi-arm study that will go on for, for three years. So that pretty much is how we are helping to treat obesity in children and adolescents um, as an addictive process. So thank you very much. I'm grateful for uh, your presentation. Thank you. And um, it was a delight to hear you. We have a couple of questions that are here from Dr. Vera Tarman. Um, she has asked, how do you account for the research by Dr. Nicole Levina that does indicate that there is a reaction to the specific ingredients of sugar to the brain? Her work suggests that this is more than a process addiction, but to the reaction to sugar specifically. The American Society of Addiction Medicine has a wealth of research that shows that sugar does have the same impact on the brain as cocaine does. Dr. Vera Tarman is the uh, medical director for Renaissance, which is a treatment facility for um, alcoholics and addicts, and also has a pilot program last year and this year for food addicts. So how would you address that? 
I, I do, I'm aware of uh, Nicole Avena's research. We actually, we just conducted a symposium at the World Congress on Psychiatry in Berlin and, and Dr. Avena was one of the presenters in our symposium. So I, I heard her presentation. It's just, there, there's a controversy there between that side of the group or that group and for example, Paul Fletcher's group which has had, they have evidence that says that no, it actually is not a direct effect. So it's still, it's still to be decided, uh, but I understand the difference. That I understand that there's two sides to this and I very much uh, appreciate Dr. Navena's, Dr. Avena's position. Okay, and another question. Cocaine cannot be smoked as it is. It has to be processed into a smokable form called crack. If sugar could be processed in a similar way, it could be smoked, i.e. by a tobacco, that tobacco does have sugar added to it, uh, or used in as an IV. I believe this is the matter of time, but why bother when we have foods like soda that carry enough sugar to do it very quickly? Well, again, I, 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 drug addicts do not shoot up on IV glucose which implies that it's, it's the taste of the sugar rather than the actual effect in the bloodstream that causes the dopamine rush. That's, I, that's the position that we, we, we have here. It doesn't really matter as far as treatment, whether, it's a, whether there's a direct effect on the brain of, for example, sugar or these highly palatable foods versus just the sensory addiction, the taste and the texture. It doesn't really matter as far as treatment because withdrawal abstinence works just the same with either one. But it's it's more just uh, I guess an academic exercise to just, to really decide whether it's a direct effect on the brain or or it's just a sensory addiction, the taste and texture. With regard to the question of taste and texture, um, there are individuals who um, have been clean and sober from alcohol and drugs for a number of years, and then lose. A significant amount of weight, perhaps 100 pounds, and they go through withdrawal symptoms that are similar to the ones that they had at the outset of their sobriety. So one theorized that um, his experience was that he was releasing toxins from his cells as he diminished the size of his body and the number of fat cells in his body. Has any of that kind of research is it out there or is this a, a few unique individuals that have experienced this, these sets of withdrawal symptoms when they've gone below the weight at which they got sober and clean? But they've stopped. Maybe that, maybe he's talking about something like, uh, I'm not sure that, I'm not, I'm not seeing any research on toxins that are so-called stored in the body and then released during withdrawal. There, there is also this whole debate on the quote, weight set point which is supposedly a, a physiological set point that every individual has that keeps their body at whatever weight their, 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 their set point is set at, at which their weight is set, set point is set. And therefore, if they try to lose weight below that set point, it pushes their weight, pushes them to eat back up to their set point again. There's some debate about whether what happens when they gain a lot of weight, does, does what, why don't they lose back down to their set point? But and the, the argument is no, that when they gain weight, it resets their set point, their weight set point to a higher level, which doesn't make much sense. So maybe, maybe that kind of thing is what maybe he's trying to, to adhere to or talk about here uh, in terms of what, why the body seems to have a point there. Mm -hmm. All right, another question. It does matter um, because the complete abstinence or gradual abstinence can affect your study of the efficacy of the app that is the gradual removal means that the addiction can delay the effect of the app versus complete abstinence. Why not do two groups? It could be really interesting with complete abstinence from particular substances, for example, sugar, grain, and then gradual diminishing. Huh, that's, that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, we're, 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 we're very much open to any and all ideas in terms of what, which would maybe show what's really happening here. Uh, we're not married to one idea. This is what we've tr tried so far is this total abstinence, but it's gradual uh, and then stay off of it pretty, pretty much. That, so whatever, we're very much open to whatever ideas you all might have or anybody has. 
Thank you for that opportunity to share ideas. Mm. With regard to the, the notion that um, one of the participants talked about that with alcohol, you could quit drinking all alcohol and you didn't have to deal with it. And so that made it different from food addiction. Um, with food addicts, rarely do people stop eating. That isn't uh, what a food addict does, but a food addict stops eating those substances that are addictive for that person. So for some, it is all grains and sugars. Some, um, there are some Mediterranean, let's see, Mediterranean, yes, the people in the um, Caribbean, not Mediterranean, sorry, the Caribbean that have fat addiction and that abstinence from fat allows them to be free from the cravings. So it isn't that an alcoholic stops drinking all things. They only stop drinking alcohol. They, they continue to drink water and other beverages. So is it not the same with food? You, well, you can't stop eating, of course, as, as you say. So it's, it's always going to be different from that and other types of addiction like alcohol or subs, other substances. But as we tried to, uh, as I tried to, to, to put the fourth position in, in this presentation, it is possible to withdraw and abstain from excessive amounts. It is possible to abstain from eating between meals. It is possible to abstain, of course, from those trigger foods, those problem foods we call them. So that 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 how you can relate the two, but you can't of course of course totally relate it because you can't stop eating. But alcoholics don't stop drinking; they still drink, but well, just non-alcoholic beverages. What if oh, what oh, if your kids oh, I, I, stop I, eating particular I, substances? Well, they're, 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 you're differentiating between different types of, of beverages, alcoholic versus non-alcoholic, and of course, Nutrisystem. If you're familiar with the Nutrisystem diet, they basically say if you eat these non -hypo, the high glycemic index ideas what behind the Nutrisystem, if you eat non high glycemic index foods continually, you won't get addicted again. So they're, they're trying to classify a whole category of foods, just like category of beverages. That's kind of, I guess, the analogy there. Might be. That makes sense. Um, Could you talk some more about this? Um, the initials that you have, the, uh, oh, I've lost my, the B, B, F, R, B. Oh, the B, Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors. Yes. That, they're fascinating. I've been reading every book and get my hands on on treatment of body focused repetitive behaviors. And every treatment that I've gotten from, from that field and applied to obesity works. It's, they all seem to be effective. So there's, that in itself kind of supports that there's this motor addiction component, which is what body focus repetitive behaviors, they're motor addictions, they're action addictions. So mm -hmm. there's definitely seems to be that component in overeating. And I think it's mixed in with this substance or sensory addiction component as well. That's why you have to treat both for maintaining. So definitely this body focus repetitive behavior field can apply to addiction. I, I spoke at the the, the International Conference on Behavioral Addictions and tried to interest them in this aspect of, that I said it's so similar to body focused repetitive behaviors and obesity. Would you like to take on obesity as a another body, another behavioral addiction? And they said, no, we would not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So whatever. Um, Perhaps they'll come around. <laughs> I, I, there's, there's a couple of questions I see in the chat. Should I... Yeah. Those, um, um, Mark Sharon says, is this application available to the public? Don't find on the app store. Here, I'll put, if I, if I can get this chat to work thing here. That's where, you, that's where this is available. It's, it's not an app store application yet. And the reason is, it's because we changed it so many, so many times and so fast. We've had 274 different versions of this app over the past seven years. And we change it sometimes in the middle of a study because something's not working quite right. We want to do it. And if we did it through the App Store, it, it takes several days to get the App Store to update your new version. And we just can't, we can't tolerate that much. We haven't had that much time, unfortunately. So that's why we keep it as what's called an enterprise app, which can be downloaded. It is available to the public. If you go to that weight, that weight I put that website up there, weightlosstogo.com. I put the, the, the way it's spelled up there on the chat. And if you go there and look, look to the left side, there is a link that allows you to download the app and install it. 
and go through the whole process. It is very much available to the public. Um, we're just coming out with a new version. We haven't quite got it up. We'll have a new version that'll have this recording their regrets feature in it. And then eventually we'll get the version that has this ecological momentary assessment. We call it the in the moment, the rescue button. Uh, that's a ways away yet. But eventually that'll all be on this same, this same site, weightlosstogo.com, which has lots of other information as well uh, about, has the instructions for the app, for example, and has articles about it and so forth. Um, so and somebody else had another question. Said, let me let me spell that first uh, so for those people who are on the telephone only. It's W eight the number eight loss L O S S the number two and then G O dot com W eight loss the number two go dot com. Thank you. Go ahead. Yep. And then there's some uh, Mark in Mark says to all panelists. Oh, again, it says the same thing about the app store thing. Okay, so I guess yeah. that, that's the that other questions I've got from the chat. Um, so, you know, there are others. Um, the question in terms of the difference between childhood and, and adolescent behaviors. Have you experienced there being a vast difference or is it pretty similar? We're seeing more and more child childhood obesity at younger and younger ages and what do you see the difference as? Well, children are not little adults, for one thing. Their, their brains are not as developed as adults, particularly the frontal lobes don't develop until late adolescence completely. So they're not able to, oh, I guess the word is to have insight as to what this, I, what's going on. They just pretty much are like on autopilot. Uh, so that's part of the problem is it's difficult. It's kind of like managing puppies a little bit. Um, yeah, but then also the it's all along the all along the same thing with puppies. Uh, parents are also very much involved in childhood obesity, even up through the early adolescence. Just very much like parents are involved, pet parents are involved with pet obesity. <clears throat> Half our pets are obese for exactly the same reason that uh, nearly a third of our children are obese. Uh, are overweight over half our children, a third of our children are overweight. Just like now, a half of our pets are overweight, overweight or obese. <clears throat> For the same reason that pet parents get love from their pets when they give food or treats to their pets, and they hooked on get hooked on this, and if they try to then cut back as well. The, the parents that are already codependent, they try to cut back, and then the pet rebels. The, the pet can even bite the pet parent, if you will. Cats can bite their parent or make their life miserable. My daughter has a cat that drove her drove her crazy because the cat continually gnawed at her feet, literally to try to get food. So she finally gave in, and then of course that reinforces the whole situation. So it goes again. So that's what's going on with pets, just like it is with children. What do you suggest to parents who themselves are addicts, and perhaps they're addicts to the codependency that you've just described, or they're food addicts or alcohol addicts in recovery, some in recovery from both? But what do you suggest to them in terms of helping their children and themselves be more consistent, perhaps? Well, that's part of that's a part of the issue is that parents themselves are, are hooked on this food eating as a way of coping or um, stress coping, dealing with stress, depression, and so forth. And it's early. It's early. They that they're that way. They have food. The junk food is around. They may even try to get the child to sit down with them and eat as one. Mother said she and her daughter would sit down and she was amazed after three hours how much, they, how much they'd eaten. She said it's like a drug for her and I. So yeah, parents can, can this can rub off on their kids. Um, parents can even sabotage the efforts of their children because it threatens the, the parent. If the parent's kind of an addicted person in this regard, they'll try to sabotage the one dad who was 400 pounds kept trying to sabotage his daughter's weight loss efforts in our study. Uh, or the parents can enable it. E either one uh, can work both ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one more question here. And let's say, okay. mm -hmm. says, can you talk? It says this is great work. Thank you. Can you talk a little more, more about how parents reacted, or how the young people might need to mitigate their parents' reaction if their parents are obese? That's kind of what you were asking, I guess, Cynthia. There is that. Does that kind of fit? Uh, can, can I answer that question? Do you think? Um, pretty much so, but in terms of the children, what can they do? Because here their parents are sabotaging them. 
they look to their parents for help, they're not receiving it, what can they do? With this intervention that I've presented, the child is the agent of change, not the parent. And children have actually had to do this completely on their own in spite of efforts of their parents to not help or sabotage at all, and, and both all of the above. One, one girl whose parents were both in their 400 pound range, she was having terrible times because the parents would order all this fast food. The pizza would come in the door. This girl, would, she would smell the pizza and the parents would offer it to her. And she was trying so hard. And what she would do actually what, on her own, she would go to, to YouTube and look at gross videos, which is where we got the idea of having gross videos in the app. She sent us the links to the gross videos and we downloaded and put them in the app. So that's how she coped with her parents, was basically to have her own intervention on the side um, with YouTube. A very creative young person. Yeah. What about the high fructose corn syrup in the highly palatable food sources and the increased um, incidence rate of, non, of fatty liver disease, but non-alcoholic fatty liver disease amongst young people? Well, there's, there's, there's a contention, uh, I think, who is it? David, Lud David Lustig, or Ludwig, I get Lustig and Ludwig mixed up, but one of those two individuals that thinks or believes he's an endocrinologist, he says that, that high fructose corn syrup is metabolized differently than table sugar sucrose, and it uh, causes fatty deposition in the liver because of the way that it's metabolized, and therefore is contributing to this fatty liver or, or non-alcoholic, you get cirrhosis from that non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease, which supposedly half the people in this country are, are now victims of, and, and, and probably uh, maybe 20% of children are too, the ones that are obese. So it is, it is a huge problem. And we're, there's actually, I heard of a report of a 16 of year old having to have a liver transplant for this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Whether, it, whether it's all due to, to high fructose corn syrup, that is still biochemically debated, uh, but it definitely is due to, to the obesity problem. Uh, whether it, high fructose corn syrup is the incriminating agent, that remains, still remains to be proven, I guess. And with regard to uh, fruit juice and the increased use of fruit juices with young people, um, increased use of fruit rather than vegetables when we went to that increasing the fruits and vegetables and now children prefer the fruit and the sweet rather than the veg. Um, have you experienced with that? Well, f fruits are, what is, what are, why are these substances, if you call them these problem foods in existence? Most, really what it is is concentrated pleasure of food. The food companies have figured out how to concentrate Sugar from fruit, for example, the oranges of today are no like no one near like the oranges that were existing in nature, or bananas or, or anything. Or, or it's pretty much been bred by humans to, and then of course you to process it. After that, you concentrate you that one one fruit juice bottle of fruit juice or glass of fruit juice is consist or is the equivalent of three or four oranges. So that's what it is. It's concentrated pleasure, concentrated sugar from from nature. Very much so, very much so. Well, um, another question there, were there any interesting responses by the peers of the individuals in the study? For example, were your clients sharing this app with other young people or showing it off at school? They were, they were, they did not, they were somewhat embarrassed for anybody else to know that they were trying to lose weight. So it was a secret for the most part. Some of their friends found out about it and wanted to use the app uh, at that point, we were still in the study mode, so it was we didn't we didn't advertise it for the public. Uh, it, it, it is available to the public, but we don't advertise it as, as such, just because we're trying to still develop it as fast as we can. Um, I say Mark Mark Sherrick Sharon Sharon he said he, he said went to Bob went to the URL and link, followed the instructions, worked perfectly. So good for him, good for Mark. And then someone else asked, they said, were there, interest, or there, were there any interesting responses by the peers? Well, that's what you asked, I guess, Cynthia, a second ago. Okay. Um, anyway, so they don't show it off at school. Well, some of them actually did because when it, it, their school peers and their teachers, even I remember so one, one child mentioned that she was going through the cafeteria line at the school and the, first, the server person behind the counter noticed how much weight this young, young, person, young gal had lost. And, and commented on it and wanted to know where, how the heck she did that. 
and of course, then she finally told her about this, this app study and the other, and that person, that server at the school lunch cafeteria wanted to, to use the same app. Um, I'm not sure whatever happened, but there are, we do see all the users on the app that are coming through that are, are not part of a group. Mostly what we've done, our studies are, are we put a, a group, create a group, and then the individuals log in or register under a specific group. So they keep all keeps all their records together. But there's a, a large contingency of those that are not in any group. We watch them daily pretty much. And they're from all over the world. So eventually this will get to the app store. Um, we can never slow down, uh, get it developed at some point. But we keep thinking, we keep realizing new things that need to be new, need, need to be put in there. If I, I've been reading religiously. Any book I can get my hands on has to do with addiction. And I get, I get new ideas every, every, almost every week and think, how, we, how can we put these in the app? Uh, that's kind of our process. Well, Dr. Predlow, this has been just delightful to hear you speak. And I want to reiterate the, the uh, way to get to this app. Is one more, one more quick question. One more quick question. Sure. sure. Go ahead. So the one lady says, do you have any plans to scale this out to adults? Would you consider creating a parallel app for adults while you were developing this one? Uh, golly, yes, if I could have a couple clones. But it, 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 it won't, it, it just, it's applicable to adults. There's, it's not really geared towards children, although maybe the graphics are a little bit more that way. But adults have used it and done pretty, run fairly well with the two. Um, so it, would, it works for adults just exactly the same. There's really no, no difference there. So that answers that question. But um, we were going to have an app for parents to take parents through withdrawal because they have this codependence problem. Mm -hmm. And we're going, actually, we're going to actually make it available, make it work for also for pet parents uh, to help them get off giving the treats to their, to their pets for the same, same process. So well, we just haven't gotten to that yet. Um, that's definitely a plan, though, hopefully at some point. Um, Oh, well, we look forward to hearing more about your uh, examples and more of the opportunities that, that are there. Someone said, fabulous work, practical, great contingency management. Um, and again, the way to get this is W8LOSS, the number two, go.com. And it has the eight and the two are numerals. So, Dr. Pretlow, thank you so much for joining us on foodaddictioninstitute.org. Uh, we're delighted to have you as, as our guest and the YouTube that will be available readily for uh, many people to watch this and to gain more information about your process. Thank you, and we'll invite you to come back. Thank, thank you very much. Thank Good you. Time. Thank you to all the attendees, and thank you to Cynthia and your panelists. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Good day.